there's something funny about dusk in the Neverglades. Ever since I was a kid, I remember staring out of my bedroom window and watching the sun dip lower and lower in the sky, until at last it came to rest just behind Mount Palmer. And then it would stick there. For a half hour, the sun would refuse to set any further, as if it had hit some unbreakable barrier on the horizon. Sometimes we wonder if it would just stop one day, leave us under an eternal sunset. But no matter how late it dawdled, there would always come a time when that sliver of light would slip below the mountain peaks and night would finally sweep in around us like it was supposed to. I'm in my 40s now. Even though the setting sun doesn't amaze me like it used to, I still find myself staring at it sometimes. Take tonight, for example. I strolled out into my backyard and found myself blinded by the little halo above the peaks of the distant mountains. Calling a poet, but it looked an awful lot like the yolk of a huge molten egg. As the sun hovered in its usual spot, I got to work building a fire. I'd retained a thing or two from years in the Boy Scouts, and it wasn't long before I had a little bed of flames burning in the fire pit. I blinked a few times. The sun had seared flashes of color into my eyes, and I pulled the inspector's card from my pocket. The light shimmered off its mirrored surface and threw rainbows across the lawn. Dubious, I flicked the card into the flames below. I caught it right away, spitting purple sparks into the air and letting out a faint hiss as it did so. When I looked up, the inspector was standing by our tool shed. A couple of months ago, his sudden appearance would have scared the shit out of me, but I'd, I'd seen a lot since the inspector had come to town. And the little magic tricks had long since ceased to phase me. Inspector, he said, how goes it? The tall man, who wasn't really a tall man, squinted at me through his cigar smoke. His trench coat and gray fedora looked muted in the orange sunlight. Mark, he said, you burn the card. Is there an emergency? Anybody or strange disappearance, maybe? I didn't pick anything up on my usual networks. Well, you could say there's an emergency of sorts. My wife cooked a dinner for five people. We only have four people to share it with. The inspector said nothing for what felt like a solid minute. His cigar smoke, a barometer for his ever-changing mood, had taken on a kind of acidic green. I don't understand. There's no emergency, no trail of bodies to follow. Jesus, you're morbid. Everything isn't always death and darkness, you know. It wouldn't hurt you to lighten up every once in a while. I still don't understand why you called me, the inspector said, frowning. His look of confusion was so convincingly human that I almost forgot that he was an eldritch monstrosity from the world next door. I leaned down and picked his card out of the dying embers. The surface was streaked with a little ash, but otherwise it looked clean and whole again. Just come inside, okay? I'd like you to meet my family. So, this is the famous federal agent, Ruth said, pulling a tray out of the oven. She eyed the seven-foot-something gray-skinned inspector with the usual amount of incredulity, but her smile was warm. I knew things would be okay here. Being a good host was in Ruth's DNA. I'm still waiting on your pot roast, but please make yourself at home. There's a closet in the front hall if you want to drop your jacket. Thank you. Um, but I'll be quite all right, the inspector said in his gravelly voice. I noticed that his cigar had stopped spewing smoke. And in fact, the cigar itself had flickered out of existence when I wasn't looking. I knew it was still there, though. The inspector wasn't the inspector without it. I could just barely make the thing out if I concentrated hard enough. <laughs> Thanks, hon, I said, giving her a kiss on the cheek. Then I gestured for the inspector to follow me into the dining room. Ruth and I had already laid out the plates and silverware, and I could hear Rory and Stephen arguing with each other through the ceiling. Probably angry over some video game. The inspector took a graceful seat and stared down at the tablecloth as if he'd never seen anything like it before. Thanks for doing this. It's highly unusual. But I appreciate you thinking of me. I nodded. The two of us fell into an awkward silence, broken only by the clatter of Ruth working in the kitchen. I I'm glad you're here, I said at last. Fighting this fight with us. Because... You know, we won't stand a fucking chance without you, right? It'd be like ants waging war on a boot. Well, this is the least we can do. 
The inspector nodded dimly, but didn't say anything. The boys had smelled the pot roast and were now wandering into the dining room, still bickering about quick scopes and hit points and other things that were surely outside the understanding of an old fart like me. They glanced at the inspector, but somehow seemed to find him less interesting than video games. They joined us at the table as Ruth walked in with a steaming platter of pot roast and green beans and mashed potatoes. And so we ate. Or at least, the puny mortals at the table ate. The inspector would bring bits of food to his mouth, and the food would disappear, but I never saw him actually chewing, probably shoving it all into a pocket dimension or something. Thank God no one else seemed to notice. I think most rational minds censor that sort of stuff to avoid the risk of going bonkers. Ruth, bless her heart, spent most of the meal trying to engage the inspector in conversation and learn more about his supposed job with the government. And even though he mumbled that most of it was clarified, he spun some surprisingly detailed anecdotes about his life in the agency and his many grueling years in Washington. I mean, don't get me wrong. I know the inspector was good, but I hadn't expected him to be such a fantastic bullshitter. It wasn't the greatest of get-togethers, but it wasn't bad either. And even though the inspector settled into the closest thing, he was going to get comfortable. Even Rory and Steven did their part to make him feel included. Complimenting his fedora, passing him seconds on the pot roast. They tried to play it cool, but I knew they liked it when I brought co-workers over for dinner. The detective life isn't exactly glamorous. But to 12 and 16 year old boys, that's the coolest thing on wheels. I was halfway into my green beans when the police radio on the counter crackled the life. Pursuit on Dare Street, said the voice of the chief. Suspect is tall, white, mid-thirties. Name, John Wendon. Last spotted leaving the Hanging Rock Bar around 5.30. All officers in the area converge on Bear Street immediately. Oh shit, Rory said through a mouthful of mashed potatoes. Rory! Ruth said in her warning voice. Rory's cheeks flushed as he hastily swallowed his food. Sorry, Mom. It's just... They're finally going to catch that son of a... Uh, that jerk. The inspector looked around the table, his brow furrowed. I noticed that he'd given up the pretense of eating his meal. The cigar was back in his mouth, and he was chewing thoughtfully on the tip. Turn on the TV, Stephen said. Maybe they got it on the news. Under other circumstances, I would have never left dinner half-eaten, but this was a big case, and one of the biggest in years, and I could feel the buzz permeating the room. I got up and headed into the den. The rest of my family trailed behind me as I picked up the remote and flicked over to the local news. I was dimly aware of the inspector joining us his eyes hidden below his fedora. Look! Rory exclaimed. Lena Dashner, head anchor of Glade News 5, was in the process of outlining the Whedon case. The suspect was on trial last year for the murder of his longtime girlfriend, Pacific Glade sweetheart Marcy McKenna. Although he was acquitted, new evidence has come to light that has brought his guilt into question. Two images flashed onto the screen. Whedon, a flat-faced man with blank eyes, and the poor dead Marcy. The picture they'd used showed her laughing at some celebrity gala, her teeth a gleaming white, and her dark hair falling into a cascade over her shoulders. Police warn all citizens that Whedon is suspected to be armed and very dangerous. If you see him, do not approach him and call the police immediately. The image shifted from Marcy's face to an aerial view of Bear Street, where no less than seven cop cars were gathered around the hanging rock. They look like a group of flashing mechanical lions surrounding their prey. They're finally gonna get that bastard! Rory blurted. Rory! Ruth said again. What? We all know he did it! It's about time that he gets what's coming to him! I glanced at my oldest son. Stephen wasn't nearly as outspoken as Rory, but there was a hardness in his eyes. And I knew he agreed. We had all loved Marcy. No one had rested easily this past year knowing her killer had escaped justice. Honestly, it was about goddamn time for this asshole to get his just desserts. Mark, the inspector said quietly. Can I speak with you in the kitchen? I glanced at my oldest son. Stephen wasn't nearly as outspoken as Rory, but there was a hardness in his eyes. I knew he agreed. We'd all loved Marcy. No one had rested easily this past year knowing her killer had escaped justice. Honestly, it was about goddamn time for this asshole to get his just desserts. Mark, the inspector said quietly. Can I speak to you in the kitchen? I tore my eyes away from the screen, where the squadron of cars had left the hanging rock and were now wailing down the length of Bear Street. 
Yeah, sure, I said. We met up by the kitchen counter, where the police radio still spat out details of the Wheaton case. The inspector glared at the device, and it instantly went quiet. This doesn't seem... off to you. I'm... not sure what you mean. The... The inspector frowned. That report said John Whedon was acquitted for murdering Marcy McKenna sometime last year. But Marcy is still alive. Or at least, she was two weeks ago. You spoke to her. Don't you remember? At the radio station. When we were working on our last case. Uh, no, you must be thinking of someone else. You weren't here when it happened, Inspector, but the McKenna case was big news last year. It was, like, JFK big news for us. I think we all remember where we were when we heard it happen. I lowered my voice and looked warily towards the den. He stabbed her. Thirty-seven times, Inspector. With a pair of scissors. They almost couldn't recognize her when they found the body. I'm not mistaken, the Inspector said with a touch of irritation. It was the same name, the same face. Do you really not remember? I tried to think back to that earlier case. To picture the woman we'd talked to at the radio station, but I only got as far as the hallway full of doors. Everything past that made my head ache, like the throbbing of a potential migraine. I shook my head. I- I'm sorry, but my-, my memory's fuzzy. I think I would remember talking to a dead person, though. Something strange is going on here. A thought specter. A doppelganger. That doesn't explain your memory lapse. Hmm. He began to pace the kitchen. This is going to require some further investigations, I think. Lena Dasher was still talking about the Whedon case in the other room, and a dim part of me registered that as being weird. This was a big story, sure, but wouldn't she have moved on by now? And, and yet another stronger part of me wanted her to keep on going. I wanted to hear every detail of the case, to watch as the police drew closer and closer to the fugitive, their lights flashing, their sirens blaring, a warning across the Neverglades. Hell, I even wanted to be on the scene when they caught him. My fingers twitched. I was struck by a sudden urge to jump in the car and join in the hunt. An urge I did my best to suppress. For the record, I think this is a wild goose chase, I told the inspector. But if you think something fishy is going on, I'll, I'll help you look into it. For Marcy's sake. The inspector nodded. But he still looked perturbed. I'll wait outside, he said. Then he was gone. Out the door in a cloud of yellow smoke. Real social butterfly, that one. Instead of heading to the police station, the inspector had me pull over next to the Pacific Glade Community Library. Getting there proved surprisingly difficult, because I kept having to stop to let streams of marching pedestrians pass. They were swarming into the streets, most of them clutching blunt objects of some kind. I saw a lot of baseball bats and golf clubs and the occasional weed whacker. At one point, I waited at an intersection for five minutes for the wave of walkers to let up. What on earth are they doing? Sweden. Gotta be. Made a lot of people really angry, and now he's... Well, being chased by police, I think their tempers finally boiled over. They want to find him first. I paused as a burly man wandered past the windshield, clutching what was very clearly a rusty axe. The inspector and I watched as he lumbered down the street and disappeared around the corner. This is insane. I can understand people being angry, but this... This is a witch hunt. I think they truly intend to kill him. I said nothing. Murder wasn't at the top of my list, of course, but I wanted Whedon punished as much as the next guy. And even though I was hardly going to take to the streets about it, I understood the impulse. People could only take so much injustice before they snapped. The library parking lot was almost empty when we finally got there. I unbuckled and made a move to open the driver's side door, but the inspector held me back. I have a feeling we may need to leave quickly, so keep the car running. I won't be long. Okay, I said warily, but he was already gone. I watched as he swept up the front steps and slipped in through the front entrance. I'll be honest, I wasn't totally sold on his plan. The place would only be open for another hour or so, and I wasn't sure what he was expecting to find in there. Plus, the longer we idled here, the more time we were giving Whedon to get away. 
I turned my eyes to the street and stared at the line of protesters as they passed. They marched with such purpose, such conviction. I was struck by a sudden powerful impulse to leave the inspector here and join the chase. My foot hovered above the gas pedal. It'd be so easy to let it fall, go tearing down the street after the most hated man in the glade. But my thoughts were interrupted by the sudden reappearance of the inspector in the passenger seat. His brow was furrowed darkly and the smoke issuing from a cigar curled around his ears in purple spirals. You said the Marcy McKenna case was the big news story of the past year. I nodded. Then explain to me why I can't find a single newspaper article about the murder or the subsequent trial. That, that can't be possible, I said, frowning. I remember waking up to the headline, Local Celebrity Brutally Murdered. The newspaper had a field day with that one. Everywhere you went, people were reading about the case. I, I, I don't know how, but you must have missed something, Inspector. His visibility bristled. I promise you, I haven't. And another thing, you said Marcy was a local celebrity. Can you tell me what she was famous for? God, I forgot how culturally illiterate you must be. Marcy did everything. She was Pacific Glade's big breakout. She had a major role in Twin Peaks back in the 90s. She did a lot of stuff on Broadway when her career really took off. She did charities and benefit shows and even shook hands with the president. She'd just come back to the Glade for a movie tour and she was murdered. Hmm. Interesting. Because when I ran a search for Marcy McKenna online, I didn't find anything matching that description. There are a few people who share her name, of course. Some of whom are moderately successful by human standards, but not Marcy herself. He thinks such a household name would be easy to find. What? N none of this made any sense. I clearly remember watching her in Twin Peaks. She was one of Laura Palmer's friends from school. She had a season-long character arc and everything. There was a huge backlash when the network killed her off. Not that this means anything to you, of course. There is no Marcy McKenna credited in Twin Peaks. There is no Marcy McKenna on Broadway. And there is no record that Marcy McKenna was ever murdered in Pacific Glade. What are you saying? I'm saying everyone in this town remembers a murder that never happened. They remember a celebrity who never was. There's no evidence that any crime ever occurred except your own memories of the event. And memories are malleable things. That's f uh, fucking absurd. I blurted out, feeling suddenly angry. You're telling me that the entire Glade has it wrong, that this whole thing is just a figment of our imaginations. I find it really fucking hard to believe that we're all sharing one hallucination. Two weeks ago, the dead were rising. Compared to what we've seen so far, this is hardly an unusual case. I... I, I don't believe you. It, it was hot-headed of me, granted, but I was seething inside for reasons I, I can't quite define. I, I'm not going to let you shit all over Marcy's memory. The inspector moved faster than my eyes could keep track, and suddenly his hand was on my forehead, his ashen skin against mine. The rage I'd been feeling melted away like an icicle in the hot sun. As the inspector withdrew his hand, I felt stirrings of the anger coming back, but they were faint. Subdued in some way that didn't quite feel real, the emotion was artificial, hadn't come from inside me. The hell's going on here? I don't know. But I intend to find out. Does Marcy have a house here in town? She shared a place with Wheaton, as far as I remember, a ritzy place overlooking Catamount Street Forest, but I... As you've so helpfully pointed out, my memory's not exactly what it used to be. You and half the town. Let's get going, then. Whedon is running from a crime he didn't commit, and we have to break this collective delusion before the police catch up with him. Assuming the angry mob doesn't get there first. The inspector looked grim. Yes. That too. Said angry mob didn't make this trip easy for us. But once we got to the back roads, things cleared up a bit more, and we were able to drive down the street without any pedestrians getting in our way. The sun still stubbornly refused to set, so our way was lit from behind by a swath of brilliant orange light. My cruiser cast an elongated shadow onto the road in front of us. The sunlight grew scarce as we entered Catamount State Forest. 
and the shadows of a thousand scraggly trees brushed against our own, creating a patchwork pattern. We rocketed through the woods, climbing higher and higher, the trees giving way to clearings with picnic tables and fire pits until, at last, we rounded a corner and found ourselves face to face with Marcy McKenna's old house. I had described the place as ritzy, but it was a lot simpler than I remembered. Just a one-story cottage with a ring of rose bushes and blue-painted shutters. Not quite sure where the memory of opulence had come from. I parked the car and the inspector and I got out. The shutters were all closed and it felt like nobody was home. There was no car in the driveway and no sound from inside. The inspector strode to the front door and rapped sharply on the wood. John. John Whedon, are you in there? No response from inside. Unperturbed, the inspector stepped down and circled around the house, sticking close to the line of rose bushes. I kept a hand on my holster and followed him. Halfway around the building, we found a shutter that was hanging half open. The inspector gingerly pried it all the way. The window behind it was blocked by a set of dark blinds that fluttered slightly, probably due to some inner ventilation system. And yeah, now what? I whispered. The inspector gestured with one finger and the blinds slid upward. Purple light spilled through the opening, so bright that I couldn't look at it directly. I could make out the vague shape of it, though. The light was streaming through a jagged gash in the air, a lightning bolt-shaped tear that floated impossibly in the middle of the living room. There were bookshelves and chairs and a solitary lamp, too, but the purple light gave them all a faded pallor, like it had sucked the color straight out. The glow was so overwhelming I almost didn't see the person standing directly behind it. She was a dark-skinned woman, a little younger than me, probably, in a flowing white blouse. Wind from the rift whipped back her hair and brought goosebumps to her outstretched arms. Her eyes were wide but vacant, and the light flickering in them, like dots of purple fire. I recognized her at once. It was Marcy McKenna. "'She's alive?' I croaked. The inspector shot me a withered look and dropped the blinds again. "'I'm not the type to say I told you so, Mark, but honestly... What did you expect? Well, not that, I said, pointing at the window. Jesus, I, I saw the crime photos after her murder, and I, I still have nightmares about her hacked up face. I remember attending the funeral, watching her father break down sobbing in the middle of, of, of his speech. These things are real. Don't you get it? I don't care if it's, if it's really Marcy in there. My memory tells me she's dead. And if I can't trust my own brain, then what else do I have? You have me. He strode to the front door, reared back, and smashed through the frame with one mighty kick. I watched numbly as the door teetered on its broken hinges and went crashing into the foyer. I was still too in shock to move, but the inspector strode inside on those silent footsteps of his. His trench coat billowed out behind him. The inspector clearly didn't care about trivial human things like laws and property lines, but I did. And goddammit, I couldn't just keep breaking into people's houses. Not even if the occupants of said houses were supposed to be dead took some serious effort to get my feet moving, but move they did, and before long I was climbing over the busted door and into the front hall of Marcy's house. I caught a whiff of the inspector's cigar. It was pungent, earthy, and traced the man himself into the room with all the light. He stood on the threshold and stared at the anomaly. It was even brighter in here than it was outside, and I could hear faint whispers for the first time, guttural words in some unknown language floating out of the rift. Marcy's shadow stood between us and the light although stood isn't quite the right word. Her bare feet hovered a solid three inches above the carpet. Marcy, the inspector said softly in the way that you might speak to a dog. It's been known to bite. Marcy McKenna, can you hear me? If Marcy heard, she gave no sign. The rift continued to whisper and the light continued to spill out of it, rippling like water. Don't, I hissed. But the inspector had already reached out and grabbed her arm. His grip was light. But her reaction was immediate and violent. She arched her back and let out a shriek that shook the glass in the windows. The waves of light took on a sharp, jagged quality and began to fire out of the rift like bullets. I ducked behind the closest bookshelf and winced as the light slammed solidly against the wood. The inspector was caught in the middle of the maelstrom, but he refused to let go of Marcy's arm. The light bullets ripped through his gray skin and left little puckered scars that drew no blood. Now Marcy was flailing, swinging her limbs in an effort to break free, but the inspector's grip had tightened like a vice. He dragged her struggling, floating body away from the rift and into the front hallway. The door, Mark, he shouted. Get the door! I darted out from my cover and ducked as a bolt of light whizzed across my scalp. 
Those things could cut holes in the inspector. I don't want to think of how badly they could hurt a fragile little human like me. I ran into the hallway, gripping the doorframe, and slammed it shut behind me. The light continued to pound against the other side, but didn't break through. Marcy had stopped flailing. She wasn't floating anymore, either. Cutting her off from the light seemed to have calmed her down. The inspector loosened his hold, but continued to keep her arm's length. Can you hear me, Marcy? He said in that same soft voice. Do you know where we are? She raised her eyes to him, saw a glimmer of that purple light still embedded in there like a tiny jewel in each of her irises. She looked between the two of us like a sleeper coming out of a damn dream. Groaning, she lifted a hand and rubbed it against her temple. I'm in my house. She mumbled. What are you, what are you doing here? Did you break in? We only wanted to save you. We saw you were in danger and came inside to help. I couldn't say a word. My tongue had glued itself to the roof of my mouth. Talking with her was like talking to a ghost. She was here. She was right in front of me. But part of my brain that seemed just as sane and rational insisted that she was buried two miles away in Locklear Cemetery. I lifted a hand as if to touch her but couldn't bring myself to do it. The paradox was almost straining my mind, and I was afraid something critical would snap if I made physical contact with her. The whole town thinks you're dead, Marcy. They're marching in the streets to find your killer. Why are they doing that? Don't they know you're here? That you're alive and safe? Awareness was coming back into Marcy's eyes, a cold somberness falling over her entire body. Her arm went limp in the inspector's grip. She looked at him, then at me, the purple light flashing in her corneas. She didn't smile, and suddenly, I was struck with a memory. Swimming in the lake as a young boy, sinking deep, far too deep, kicking my legs in every direction as I tried to rise back to the surface, but even the sun was dark down here, and I, I couldn't see which way was up. Couldn't hold my breath, and blackness swept over me. So pressure squeezed my lungs. It was a memory, but it wasn't at the same time. Even though I could distinctly remember that afternoon in the lake, I was aware somehow that Marcy had implanted it in my head. It's like the surge of anger I'd felt at the inspector earlier. It was inside me. But it had come from outside me. The real question, Marcy said quietly, is if the whole town thinks I'm dead, then what the hell are you two doing here? The inspector stiffened. Something dark had come into Marcy's voice, a bitterness that I didn't like one bit. She looked at the inspector's hand like it was some sort of alien tentacle, but didn't try breaking free again. Is it you? Are you the one giving people these false memories? Marcy glared at him. The jewels of light spun in her eyes, and I got the sense that she was trying to broadcast some sort of nightmare into the inspector's brain. But if it worked, he didn't show it. He chewed the end of his cigar and blew a pink smoke ring down the hall. So you effectively faked your own death. You turned yourself into a star and John into a pariah, but why? Why go to such extremes? In response, Marcy grabbed her arm and yanked back the sleeve of her blouse. The skin of her forearm was lined with thin horizontal scars. Some of them looked sore and fresh. I was struck with another memory that wasn't my own dragging a razor blade across my skin, cutting ribbons into the flesh. The memory of the pain made my arm throb. Because John is an abusive fuck who deserves every second of this. Because he brought me so low that I mutilated myself for him. Because I can't hit back, but this town can hit for me. I made them love me. I can make them kill for me, too. All it takes is one person to throw the first stone. I felt a chill run down my arm. The inspector stared at her for a few long seconds, then pulled me aside so we could speak privately. He kept one eye on Marcy as he did so. She remained in her crouched position in no apparent hurry to go anywhere. I'm the one who stands any chance of closing that rift. You need to head back into town and contain the mob before they kill John. How? Christ, inspector, there's so many of them. I I'm just one guy. How can I change their minds? I can't exactly tell them Marcy's alive. I'm looking at her right now, and I still don't quite believe it. Listen to me. She may be controlling their thoughts and memories, but she can't control their actions. Every choice they make is still their own. 
If you appeal to their better nature, convince them they're above such pointless violence, you might sell them long enough for me to do whatever needs to be done here. No one has to throw any stones today. What needs to be done? I repeated. I looked past him at Marcy's slouched form, her eyes dark and wary. If we can play our cards right, everybody survives the night. But that doesn't happen unless we act quickly. I can handle things here. You need to go. Now. My mind was on edge. I was pretty sure it had nothing to do with Marcy's mojo. This anxiety was 100% homebrewed Hannigan. But I didn't let it keep me from moving. I left the inspector in the hallway, ran back to my cruiser, and revved the engine. The house's front door was still kicked absurdly back into its hinges, and in the opening I saw the inspector's shadow leaning over Marcy and pass a hand over her forehead. He looked like a priest issuing the last rites to a dying patient. Marcy shuddered and went limp. I backed out of the driveway and spun the cruiser around, but the route back through the forest was suddenly a lot more treacherous than it had been ten minutes ago, because the mob had spread. People roamed across the street in large clusters, everyone clutching a makeshift weapon, everyone looking ahead with cold, grim resolve in their eyes. I could barely go ten feet without another swarm of them stepping out in front of my car. My headlights washed over them. No one looked back at me. He was clear there was only one thing on their minds. Whedon. As I watched the procession move steadily down the street, I pictured a cliff in my mind, and the crowd pushing forward to the lip of it was that precipice. They could see it coming. There was plenty of time to stop, to turn around, to return to safety, but they wouldn't stop. They would fling themselves gladly over the edge, smiling as they plummeted to the bottom. How could I talk that many people back from the edge? Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to tell you thank you for watching tonight's video. If you want to check out more from MCP, you definitely can at patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta if you want to help support the show. And I'm available on iTunes and Google Play and on Spotify as a podcast. Uh, yes. Also, I want to tell you guys in an effort to kind of like help out as many of the No Sleep authors as I can, there is a Kickstarter currently being uh, done. An all-women horror anthology. That's right, it's 43 horrific tales, all from women of the no-sleep uh, community. Well, it's currently about halfway to goal, and it's got a little more than a month left to go. So if you guys are interested, I'm going to have a link in the description down below. Check it out. It's a great collection of stories from wonderful authors, and being able to get support for this, I know they're seriously looking for. So um, check it out, guys, and thank you so much for watching also. Sweet dreams.